Welcome to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, the president and founder of Creation Training Initiative. And we have a wonderful program for you this day. We have a special guest, Dr. John Wickham. Welcome, Dr. Wickham. Welcome to our show. Thank you, Mike. It's a joy and a privilege to share. Now, you're, I call you a very special guest because you're what we call one of the pioneers of the creation movement. When did you get started in creation? Well, I had a bad start. I was a godless evolutionist at Princeton University in 1942 and 43. I didn't come from a Christian home, didn't have that wonderful privilege. But it got, in God's wonderful mercy and grace, a missionary from Afghanistan and India was on the campus at that time. And a student came and knocked on my door in the freshman dormitory at Pine Hall. And he said, John, you know, I was with you in prep school a year ago in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I'm just here to invite you to come to a Bible class at Mary Dodge Hall here on the campus Sunday afternoon. You'll hear a wonderful Bible teacher. I said, I can't possibly be less interested in the Bible. Then he did an awful thing. He went home and prayed for me. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. I think he came back two or three times. I finally said, you know, to get him off my back, okay, I'll come. And I've never recovered. I heard the Bible beautifully explained, and I say thank you, Lord, for that contact. Isn't it great when we can find a pastor who really preaches the Word of God and rather than giving stories? Amen. He told me exactly what the Bible says. I had never really heard that before. And I say thank you, Lord, for what you did in your mercy and grace at Princeton University. And finally, in February of 1943, after two or three months of coming to that class, he came to my dorm room explained the gospel. He didn't argue about evolution or other science issues that I, I was majoring at that time in uh, political science and I was taking courses on geology, paleontology, evolutionism and so forth. He didn't argue. He just said, God has a plan for your life. And here it is. He told me about Jesus who died for my sins, rose from the dead. And that night I accepted him as my savior and my Lord. Wow. Just that's the gospel, the power of the gospel. Amen. We don't have to use a lot of fancy words. No. It's not our wisdom, it's God's wisdom. Amen. And today, that's what we use a lot of the creation information about, is to break down the strongholds and get to the gospel, the real power. Amen. Now, you have quite a history, Dr. Wickham. You were also in World War II. Well, it happened like this. About a month after I finished my first year, I got a letter from the government saying, Greetings you will be inducted into the U.S. Infantry at Fort Bragg, North Carolina in April 1943. And of course, a year and a half later, finally, after studying at VPI, uh, Virginia Military Institute, excuse me, I was shipped to Europe in the 84th Infantry Division, arrived in Normandy Beachhead several months after the invasion, and was uh, made a, a German interpreter because I had studied German at Princeton for a year, my first year. They said, you're the only one here that speaks any German. So I want, we want you to tell these German prisoners in the Red Ball Express what to do to load these trucks with ammunition and food and get it to the front line in Germany. So for several months, I had an opportunity not only to practice my German, but to tell some of them about the Lord. And I say, thank you, God, for this marvelous opportunity to share the gospel in the German language. Now you were also in one of the very famous battles in World War II. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, Mike, when we finally got to the German front line in, in the Ruhr Valley near Aachen, the Germans counterattacked with a third of a million soldiers. We were taken totally by surprise. At that time, my father was chief of staff under General Patton in the Third Army to the south. I was in the Ninth Army in the north. We were pushed back into Belgium in those mountains in the, one of the coldest winters in European history. We lost 19,000 men killed, 70,000 wounded. And I was almost killed one night. I was on guard duty. I went down into my fire direction center, field artillery battalion, in the basement of that building. And as German, I can't, pardon me, an artillery shell exploded just where I sat. God got my attention in a special way. I have never forgotten that one. 
Now, I've had the opportunity to interview a lot of World War II veterans, and every one I interview is just like you, Dr. Whitcomb. Yes. It's like it was yesterday to you. It's, yes. It's so relevant. Amen. But you were in the Battle of the Bulge. Right. A very famous battle where many did lose their lives. Yes, yes. But you also now have something most of us don't have. You have firsthand physical warfare. You were a battler in there, a soldier, and you're also a soldier in the battle spiritual warfare. Amen. And that's the battle you're in today, and you've been fighting that battle for a long time. Long time. To bring as many as you can to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Right. Now, when did you get into teaching and talking about creation? What happened was that uh, Dr. Donald Fullerton, who led me to the Lord at Princeton, he was a Princeton grad himself, taught me about the gospel, New Testament basically, but I didn't understand and get into origins, creation, the flood, geology, all those issues at that time. He, however, in God's providence, recommended that I go to Grace Seminary in Winona Lake, Indiana, where I entered as a student in 1948, studied for three years under Alva J. McLean, Herman A. Hoyt, godly, godly men of God. But at that time, the gap theory was very prominent, that there were millions of years, supposedly, between Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. And so I just picked that up and taught that theory. Then, in the amazing providence of God, a creation scientist showed up and gave a lecture in the fall of 1953. Henry Morris. He, he told me and the crowd of people that were there, the Genesis flood is the key, the dynamic for washing away those millions of years. And I said, Henry, thank you. I'll never teach the gap theory again, but pray for me. I'm going to spend time now writing a doctoral dissertation on the flood. I spent three years on that, Mike, till 1957 to earn my doctorate. And then he agreed with me to co-author the book. We spent three more years until 1960, 500 pages on the magnitude and effects of the flood. And I, I say, thank you, Lord, for that wonderful provision you gave to me. My spiritual father at Princeton, theological father at Grace Seminary, and now my creation science father, Henry Morris. God knew I needed a lot of help. <laughs> we all do. We Amen. All do. Now, the, the, that book, The Genesis Flood, was one of the earliest books, and it was, it's a book that has changed many people's lives yes. to understand that God is the creator of all things. How many printings have we gone through with that book? Well, it's amazing. I think uh, maybe about f 45 printings, and I say, Lord, thank you for this 50th edition. 50th edition. We wow. added another 40 pages to explaining the background, what God has done through this book. And now it's in several languages around the world. And in spite of the fact that it's kind of a big book, it's not something you just hand out in a street meeting. No. <laughs> God has used it for his glory. And it is, it is a great book. And I would highly recommend, if you don't have this book, it is one to get. 50th edition of The Genesis Flood by Henry Morris and Dr. John Whitcomb. Yes. Now, you've written many other books, too, haven't you? Well, Tell us some about those. We uh, did a sequel to that book called The World That Perished, sort of updating the response that people had to our Genesis flood book. Objections, questions, problems. So we wrote simplified responses showing that God really meant what he said. I mean, the flood is not some theoretical, imaginary thing. Jesus said, so shall it be at the end of the world as in the days of Noah. For in those days, men were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until Noah entered the ark and the flood came and wiped them all away. Jesus believed in the flood and the ark and Noah. And I say that settles it. The creator of the universe wasn't mistaken. Isn't it a shame we have so many sitting out there in church today that don't believe the words of Jesus or don't believe God's word in the beginning? Isn't that sad? I've learned, Mike, as you have, we don't argue with people about the scientific possibilities of all these things like creation and the flood. We say, here's what the Lord said, and he was there. He doesn't lie. And I say, Lord, help me to keep focused on what God himself has said and trust the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, to illuminate, convict, and bring people to faith, not just science arguments. They're, they, they're interesting. They're important at times. But the, the basic thing is to get people to know the Lord. 
Right. In other words, the, you, you said out right away, the Bible is the authority on all matters and issues. Amen. And that's what we should be doing as Christians, but unfortunately, many aren't. There are some out there that just want to hold to millions and billions of years, but you've got another book on that uh, called The, uh, the, was it the right. Early Earth right. that handles those objections also, why we should trust the Bible. So tell us a little bit about that book. Yeah, Mike, The Early Earth helps us to see at least three things about Genesis chapter 1. Number one, those six days were literal 24-hour days in sequence. I mean, God said that when he wrote with his own finger on the tablets of stone and the Ten Commandments. In six, you, six days shall you labor and do all your work, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them is. All the angels, all the animals, all the people, everything in six days. I say, amazing. Thank you, Lord. Because when you look at Genesis chapter 1, you can see that each day has a number with it. Second day, third day. Whenever the word day has a number, it means 24 hours. God says, I'm interested in chronology. That's the foundation of history, chronology. Yes. Mm -hmm. Secondly, we found out the order in which things happen. Uh, God created the earth, angels first, of course, then the planet earth moments later, according to Job 38, 7. And then he created plant life on the third day, all the trees and flowers before the sun and moon were even existing. That always brings up a great question. Right. And I get this challenge. How can the first three days be literal days without a sun? Right. God expects us to ask that question. He sure does. And here's, this seems to be the answer. God is showing us that there's a problem with the sun, S-U-N. Because when Moses wrote this account, Egyptians worshipped the sun as a god. Ray was his name in their, in their religion. God is saying, don't you dare worship the sun. It is not ultimate. It is not infinite. It was not even here at the beginning. I-S-O-N was here, not the S-U-N. It's an order of priorities. And I say, th thank you, Lord. I never thought of that. Well, he also showed us in one Romans 1, 19 to 20, he's given us all the evidence. Right. Even when we look at the scientific evidence, and not right. that we need that. Yes. Because we don't need the sun for a day. Because right. the definition of day is just the rotation of the earth once on its axis. Yes. So he's given us his word. Don't worship the sun. It's yeah. a created thing. I'm yeah. the living God. Right. And he said, I can give you light without the sun. Amen. Well, of course, he expects us to realize that you don't have to have the S-U-N to have a day. You need a fixed astronomic light, which he created on day one, in reference to which the earth went through three 24-hour uh, cycles. And that temporary light was replaced by the sun on the fourth day. But you know, Mike, there's a third thing about Genesis 1 that fascinates me. We discussed in our early earth book, the manner in which things were created, full grown trees that looked like they were maybe 30 or 40 or 50 years old. God didn't want to have Adam and Eve wait 30 years to have fruit to eat. Yes. He said, here are the trees now full grown right there. And as, as a matter of fact, that's how Adam was created, full grown, in minutes. If you had met him in the garden an hour later, say, where did you come from, sir? Well, I came out of the ground right over there an hour ago. Incredible. Yes, Imp it was a mature creation. Isn't that amazing? Because it wouldn't work if Adam and Eve would have started as right. babies, yeah. the and, first two humans. And, and Eve, too, yes. was created full grown out of the body of Adam. And I say, Lord, with you, with you, all things are possible. So we've got a, a number of the word day. We got Exodus 20, verse 11, which is commandment number four. God right. wrote that down on the tablets. Right. What more evidence do we need? Why aren't people believing this? Are you ready for the answer? Yes. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the rulers of the darkness of this age. And Satan and demons hate God's precious word. That's an ultimate issue. I don't see demons. I don't see Satan. God says, trust me, there's a battle going on here, a warfare being waged. There's more involved in this battle for truth, for God, for creation, for redemption, resurrection of Jesus from the dead, ultimate plan for the coming of the kingdom than you can see with your mortal, your, uh, you can't see this, but trust me, it's happening. Things really haven't changed at all from all the way back in the days of Jesus and Paul and the apostles. Right. There were people in the synagogues preaching false doctrines, coming right. in preaching false doctrines, 
wanted to have a different gospel. We're having the same thing happen in church today. We have people coming in preaching false doctrines, even a different gospel when they talk about billions of years being yes. death before sin. Right. And that, that undermines the gospel. It's a whole different gospel at that point. Right. So we haven't changed at all, have we? No. And God says, trust me, I know what I said, and I meant what I said, and I expect you to believe what I said by the power of the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. But many are still deceived today. Yes. It's the same tactics that Satan used in the Garden of Eden. Yes. Deception, distorting God's Word, causing doubt, and then denial of God's Word. Yes. That's still happening in churches today, and people are, don't recognize there's a spiritual warfare. In America, we, we seem to be too intelligent to understand there's a spiritual war, and many churches don't even teach it right. anymore today. Praise, praise God for His precious Word. It's infallible, inerrant, inspired, and, and it's absolutely perfect. 66 precious books telling us exactly what He wants us to know. Thank God for the Bible. Now, you, you've been in this for how many years have you been teaching creation? Well, I would say since about 1953, since 1953. I don't even know how many years ago that was, Mike. Well, I was young then. <laughs> <laughs> I was young then. I was just yes. Young. 1953. You've seen an awful lot in this creation movement. Can, yes. can you tell us some of your uh, high, highlights in the creation movement and some of the things you've had to deal with on all these years in yes. creation? Yes. Well, as a matter of fact, God has given Norma and me a wonderful opportunity to travel all over the world. I mean, entirely around this planet. She was a missionary with her first husband for 11 years in the Philippines. We've lectured about these things in the Philippines, in Taiwan, in Korea, in Hong Kong, China, several times in Singapore, twice in Australia, many times back in Europe, even in Central African Republic, twice. And I say, well, thank you, Lord, for helping us to spread the message all over this planet Earth and to see that in every country, the need is the same, a Savior, a Bible, the blessed Holy Spirit to illuminate and tell us exactly what God meant by what He said in the only book He's ever written. So all over the world we say, we look back, Lord, isn't it amazing that You've allowed us to travel like this and to share the wonderful truth of God's Word in this generation. What a privilege to have that tra those travels. Now, have you met a lot of opposition do you remember any times you had some real opposition come against you? Well, uh, it's kind of a sad story, of course, but uh, I, I, let me give a, a, a good statement Jesus made about this. Beware if all men speak well of you. In other words, if everybody says, oh, here comes dear Dr. Whitcomb. Isn't this wonderful? You look out, you, maybe you're not saying the whole counsel of God. Yes. Now, we don't go around trying to provoke opposition. But the, even the mighty apostle Paul, who taught for two years in the school of Tyrannus in Ephesus, when he finally ended up in a, in a prison, a dungeon, where he died, he said in his last letter, last letter to Timothy, all the of Asia have forsaken me. Now, it doesn't mean they lost their salvation. It means they had, they'd lost their connection with his style of teaching, his approach to doctrine, theology. And so... I, I've seen that even with some of my former students uh, turning away because creationism in many areas is not popular. It creates a tension in high schools today, as we know, across America, in universities, Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Dartmouth, Car Cornell, all these Ivy League schools that once were created, most of them, to train preachers yes. have turned totally away from God's Word. Jonathan Edwards is one of the first presidents at Princeton. He's buried in a cemetery right near the campus. I went there several years ago, leaned over and heard him turning over. <laughs> I mean, you can't believe the changes that have happened down, and even many Christian students in so-called Christian colleges and seminaries are intimidated, threatened yes. by this opposition. Even in our Christian high schools, we have a lot of that. And yes. unfortunately, there's many church leaders out there, pastors, who are teaching evolution or forms of evolution right. from the pulpit. Yes. We have a, but uh, I look at it this way, Dr. Whitcomb. You're in the Army, I was in the Marines, and we have a job to do. Amen. But we, have, we had a job physically to do, but we have a job spiritually to do. And yes. that is never give up to our, we fight all the way to our last breath. In the Marines, yes. we're trained. If you see a hill, 
you go take that hill. <laughs> we take the hill. Amen. So we're to give, we're to give it our all because Jesus Christ gave his all for us. Amen. We shouldn't give anything less, should we? Amen. Praise Matter of fact, you even have a book about him, don't you? Uh, you had a book well, on Jesus Christ there. You see, this is one of the problems today. Many people who reject evolution are ashamed of Jesus. You say, what do you mean? Well, it's the intelligent design movement. Yes. And thousands of scientists around the world today, it's amazing, are saying, we really can't accept atheistic, godless evolutionism. Someone designed the world. There had to be an intelligent designer, but we won't tell you who he is. And I say, no, wait a minute. You won't tell him who he is? Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I'm, I'll be ashamed of you someday. So we wrote a book called Jesus Christ, Our Intelligent Designer, An Evaluation of the Intelligent Design Movement. And here's what Jesus said, Luke 9, 26. Whoever is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory. So we should say, well, Lord, help me to see. It's not enough to say there was some kind of a design, an intelligence, a creator of some kind back there billions of years ago. We have to do the biblical approach, a recent creation, not millions of years, uh, full-grown things created instantly. Genesis, absolutely inspired in what it tells us how, when, and what order things happen. That's what God requires of us, to honor His Son and His Word and not make compromises like is so common today. Yes. Now, Dr. Wickham, if people wanted to get a hold of these books, how can they do that? We have a website that is available, whitcombministries.org. Whitcombministries.org. So right. we're going to put that up on, on the video so everybody can not only hear you say it, but see it. So they can go to that website and order these books. And I highly recommend this book, Jesus Christ, Our Intelligent Designer, so we don't get confused by God's Word and the intelligent design movement. Right. Praise the Lord. Well, Dr. Wickham, I want to thank you very much for being our very special guest. We, now, we didn't even cover the flood. Would you come back and do a second session for us on just the Genesis flood? With God's help. Okay. God. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much, Dr. Wickham. And thank you, and God bless all of you out there. And again, that website? WhitcombMinistries.org. Well, thank you, and we'll see you next session on with Dr. John Wickham and the Genesis flood. If these lessons had been a blessing to you, you might consider financially supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can do this by going to our website, creationtraining.org. Again, that's creationtraining.org. Your tax-deductible donation of just $20, $50 or more a month, or a one-time gift of any amount will make you an education partner in building an army of Christian educators who can teach the biblical account of creation and train others to be able to defend their faith and be biblically faithful to God's word as it states in 1 Peter 3.15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear.